my name is Tim Holt, and I want to welcome you to the uh, monthly program of the Carlisle C Council on Aging, the Carlisle Community Forum. Uh, it's been a while since I've been here, and it's always great to be back and work with my great friends at the Council on Aging on this, sh on this television show. I think we have an excellent program today where you're going to hear about all of the many amazing programs and activities that are put on by the Council on Aging, but we also have a special guest today uh, whom I'll introduce in a moment, and we're going to be speaking about rehabilitation services at Emerson, which is a topic uh, I think that'll be of great interest to many of, uh, many of our uh, audience. Um, it is the February, by these, these things air at different times, this is the February show, so I hope everybody's had a, a fantastic uh, Valentine's Day with your Valentine, whoever that may be. Uh, uh, and I know that everybody's looking forward to spring and the warmer weather, but remember, it is still cold, and last year we had a nasty uh, March, uh, so remember that there is ice out there, and there, and the driving can be treacherous uh, whenever there's a storm. So we're near spring, and we're getting there. But let's just remember to be careful uh, through that, throughout the, the the rest of the winter season. I'd like to introduce now, as we start, the people who are sitting at the uh, at the table in front of you. Uh, on your far left is Peg Gladstone, who is representing the Friends on the Council of Aging today, and she'll be uh, in the program telling us about the things that are, uh, uh, the, the Friends are doing to support the Council on Aging. Uh, next to her is Angela, okay, who everybody knows, Angela Smith, who's the Director of uh, Outreach and Program for the COA. Uh, next to her is Debbie Farrell, who's the Transportation Coordinator for our Carlisle COA, and on your far right uh, is, excuse me, Richard Casas, who is the uh, outpatient director of rehabilitation for the Emerson Rehabilitation Center. So that's the folks who will be talking to us today. Uh, and uh, first I'm going to have Angela lead things off with a little welcome from the COA and tell us the sort of top line things that are happening right now. Hi, Tim. Thank you all for coming, and uh, we appreciate your being here. We just want to welcome people and to follow up on your wonderful introduction. It's not just being careful while you're driving. It's also being careful while you're walking on the ice. And um, Debbie reminded me this morning about we've had several of our seniors um, shoveling and not realizing there's ice underneath. So reminding people to use some spikes um, on their shoes, and you can get them very cheaply at Job Lot in Bedford. So uh, consider getting them for about $5 and prevent yourself from falling if you're going to have to walk on any um, surfaces that might be icy. And we always remember some people who may not be seniors who, look at our, who are watching the show to think about the seniors that may live around you and uh, when there is a storm or inclement weather, what you might be able to do to help them out a little bit. And the only other thing I want to do before we get started with Peg is to remind people about the new Ask a Nurse program. So um, twice a month on the 18th of March and on the 22nd of April, we have a wonderful nurse, Trish McGeehan from Emerson who um, we were lucky to get through the Chana grant. And she comes and f she's here in town hall in the Nichols conference room for an hour. And anybody that has a question can come and talk to her, bring their meds, talk to her about something that's bothering them, some questions they have, some instructions they've gotten from their doctors that they'd like some help understanding or concerns they have, and she'll help them figure out what's the right thing to do. And like an ombudsman. You know, the, uh, what is the grant? Could you just? It's um, the Chenar grant was a community grant that was applied for by the Board of Health, the Council on Aging, and the Planning Board. And we got an amount of money that allowed us to do several things. One was hire a community health nurse who's doing Ask a Nurse program. She's meeting with some of our seniors, and she's also um, available to do two blood pressure clinics a month for us at our Chelmsford Crossing Lunch and at our men's breakfast. 
and she's doing some articles and some training for us. The grant runs through August, and another portion of the grant is being used for transportation, and later Debbie's going to talk about a lift program that's getting some subsidies because of that grant. And there's also um, a third piece that is running out of my mind right now um, that I Oh, I know. It has to do with getting money for the community center planning. So to do a review or to have an architect look at putting a plan in place, review the um, space that we're looking at and plan? say, is it feasible and what things would be like. It's like Rick Perry. You couldn't remember that last <coughs> department he wanted to get rid of. From. <laughs> but you re at least you remembered it. <laughs> so with that, um, I'm going to have you uh, turn to Peg, please. So the, yeah, as, as you, m people who watch this program know that Friends of the Council on Aging uh, is a, a group of people who solicit funds uh, and use those funds to assist the Counseling on Aging to do things that they can't do through the funding that is provided by the town. Uh, and over the years, it's provided invaluable services and a great partnership with the town in terms of uh, getting to those extra things that make a great deal of difference but just don't fit within the normal budget. Uh, and Peg has been involved with it for a number of years. And uh, please. Thank you, Tim. Um, first off, I would like to tell everybody thank you to the donors who have donated to our fundraising. And unfortunately, we did not meet our fundraising goal this year, Tim. So in fact, an anonymous donor has given us a grant that will go through May, and he will match 100% of the folks' donations that come in now. So it would be great if anybody has um, some extra interest or uh, financial ability to support us. That would be wonderful. And that will go till May. And our P.O. Box is P.O. Box 38 here in Carlisle. And some of the upcoming things that the Friends are supporting. In March, there's going to be the Arts Matter program, and we support this with the Friends of the Library, the Gleason Library. It will be housed at St. Irene's, and it's going to be three Wednesdays in March, starting at 1.30. You have to register at the library for that. And then coming in April, we have the Spring Lecture Series, and it's going to be two uh, different events. Um, people will be speaking on um, health, there's going to be one on Think Positively and Live Longer and Healthier, and that will be April 5th. And then on April 17th, it's going to be a lecture on Oh, Your Aching Joints and Hip and Knee Arthritis and Modern Joint Replacement. And that's also with the friends. It will be at the library, and you have to register for that at the library. That's and in April. That also focuses on um, has Dr. Howard, who is another Emerson doctor. So, so get inspired by the arts and then figure out how to take care of your knee. Totally. <laughs> walk, and, and walk safely on the ice. Yes. yes. So that's the way to go. I love that arts program. That, that woman is gifted in her ability to take, uh, to make the arts come alive for people, I think, in a very, very positive way. And there's it's, Calder, right? There's Calder in it. I, and I do believe, yeah. yes. And yes. It, she has got, it's on Impressionism this time yeah. and... Post-impressionism uh, post, and, yes. and culture. I've, I've always thought that a, a person who knows a great deal about the arts and a, and a relative uh, newcomer can both be stimulated by that program. She does a really fantastic she, job. She yeah. really yes. makes art come alive, and you don't have to understand it to enjoy it. Yeah. And so we get a great audience, and because it's at St. Irene's, we're very lucky that we don't have a head count. Yeah. That's right. Not Which that we means. would ever put more people in a room that the, we not allowed. <laughs> well, Which it's a nice <laughs> excuse to get out in, as you said, some of the crazy weather we can potentially have, but to be safe with it. So, so. we'd like to thank the friends because um, it's through their generosity that we're able to subsidize exercise program, have the programs that right. Peg talked about, also provide some help with fuel and food assistance and help with medical equipment and so many more things that um, when we just are stuck, somebody comes to us with a need that we can't satisfy, we can go to the front. Well, let's, you know, I mean, I want to reemphasize what Peg said, that uh, they're a little bit behind and they need to get donations. It's very generous. <coughs> Carlisle, it happens quite often uh, when an organization is not there. Uh, 
people step up and do this matching thing, which is wonderful, and basically doubles your gift. And uh, let's do it. Uh, let's, uh, you know, if you're thinking about the Council on Aging or the programs that they have, this is the opportunity to make sure that they all uh, are, remain in place. So let's, uh, let's make sure that we get back to that goal. Okay. Sounds great, Tim. Thank you. Thank you, Peg. All right. So that it? All right. With that, thank you very much. I thank appreciate you. your coming today. Um, so with that, let's, let's, let's move to our program with, uh, with Richard Fosses. Uh, uh, we're lucky to have Richard here today. Emerson, uh, in general, and Emerson Rehab have become a significant part of the communities of, of Concord and Carlisle in terms of the services that they that they offer, and Richard uh, has been in the rehabilitative and physical therapist uh, business, if you will, for 16 years. Okay, he was uh, he's a native of Malden, Massachusetts. He now lives in Burlington with his wife and three children, uh, and he has uh, currently in the position of the director of outpatient services for Emerson Rehabilitation, and we're pleased to have him here today to help us uh, talk a little bit and sort through some of the issues related to rehabilitation and what Emerson can offer. So with that, I'll let you give a little introduction here about Emerson Rehabilitation Services, and, and then we'll have a little dialogue. Sure. Thanks, Tim. Um, <clears throat> so like Tim mentioned, my name is Rich Casas. I'm the uh, operations manager for the outpatient rehab department of Emerson Hospital. Uh, currently, we have five different outpatient locations. Uh, our main biggest location is over at Baker Ave in Concord. We have another big location uh, just down the street in Westford on Littleton Road. And we have another location in Westford at the Millworks Complex um, that we opened up in about a year ago. Um, and we also have another location in Chelmsford uh, at a strength and conditioning facility. And we also see patients at Lawrence Academy in Groton. Now, do they all do the range of services, or do they specialize? Are you, are uh, the, our main locations in Westford and Concord do a range of services. So the one on Littleton Road in Westford and in Baker Ave and Concord, we have three different disciplines. We have physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy that all work in those locations. Our other location uh, in, at the Millworks in Westford, Lawrence Academy, and uh, Skill of Strength in Chelmsford, right now only do physical therapy at those locations. Um, but in any of those locations, we can see a variety of, of injuries or, or meet any needs that, that fall within that need. Um, I was saying we see about 300 people a day uh, between all the different locations, so we have a, a very large facility. Um, we are directly tied in with Emerson Hospital, so we have all the great resources of the hospital, so we can talk to any of the physicians, we can make phone calls, a lot of them, a lot of times we're right in the same office as a lot of the physicians, so, you know, it really makes communication great for us if we have a question on what somebody's coming in for and things like that. Yeah. The, uh, one of the things that we had, were, ch were chatting about briefly before the program was, uh, I, my, my assumption is that a person uh, encounters the need for some sort of rehabilitation through their medical professional. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, very often that is the case that that is at Emerson Hospital for our, for our residents. Uh, and can you talk a little bit about why Emerson Rehab is a good partnership if you are, you know, seeing, uh, seeing a, a physician at Emerson or being treated at Emerson? Okay. Yeah, sure. Um, like I mentioned earlier, it, for us in our perspective, I think it's really all about the, the communication and the ease of communication. Um, having that direct connection with the physician that um, a patient or a client might be coming in from makes it a lot easier for us just to pick up the phone, dial their four-digit extension and say, hey, Dr. Howard, I'm seeing this patient that you did that knee replacement on, I have a question. It's probably much easier for one of my clinicians to get in touch with Dr. Howard than it would be for somebody who works for maybe a small private practice and things like that. Um, but again, being tied in with the big hospital, we just have resources that a lot of places may not have. We have a medical library at the hospital that we can research if we need to. Um, you know, we have lots of other ancillary services that we can reach out to if I have a need to. So if sometimes patients have questions on diet and nutrition. We have dietitians that we can reach out to. Sometimes we start seeing somebody for a total knee replacement with Dr. Howard, for example, and then we notice they might have some other needs that maybe they should be seeing a speech therapist or they might be, shouldn't be seeing an occupational therapist. 
and having all those resources under one roof makes it real easy to coordinate that care for the patient. So I, I would say that's probably the biggest thing is just the ease of coordinating care, um, home care PT to outpatient PT to back to the referring physicians. It just it's so much easier when it's all mm -hmm. under one network. And if I'm a, my, well, I would imagine, uh, and, and I may well be, if I'm a patient uh, in need of rehabilitation services, there's a sort of ominous thing about that. What it, you know, I haven't been there before. Mm -hmm. How long am I going to be there? Am I going to get consistent care through the same professional? Absolutely. Uh, is it, uh, and in these times, uh, how much is it going to cost? Mm -hmm. And, you know, how long does it get, is the, my Medicare pay for it? Those right. kind of things. So if you could, you could talk about a few of those yeah. things, that would be. Um, you know, anytime you start getting into the, the finances of, of healthcare, it's a, it's a, very complicated and, and convoluted system, so there isn't a lot of times one direct answer, but I'll try to, to speak to that the best I can. Like you mentioned, most of the time people are accessing our services through their physician. So they go to their physician, and if they just have general aches and pains or something like that, they might bring it up to their primary care physician, who will then recommend either physical therapy or occupational therapy or something like that. A lot of times it's a little bit more of a direct and obvious connection. If you're having a, some sort of surgery, like a total knee replacement or a total hip replacement, that you're gonna follow up with outpatient rehab after that. Um, so depending on your insurance, the way it would generally work is people will call one of our locations, say that they're looking to schedule an appointment with us. We have insurance coordinators on site who will help take, out, take down some of that information. Is it Medicare? Do you have a secondary insurance or a supplemental insurance? Or do you still have private insurance? You know, each of those have little different rules and regulations and, and systems that you have to go through. So again, as I said before, having a large supportive network like Emerson Hospital, we have those kinds of resources to be able to make those phone calls and get into those, the weeds of the, the insurance and figure that stuff out for the patients. Once they're coming to us, um, the cost can vary. Most of the time, Medicare is going to pick up the majority of the cost. Most patients have a secondary or supplemental insurance that will pick up the remainder of the cost. But a lot of times now there are co-payments or deductibles that people might have to pay going into there. And that can vary from maybe a couple $10, $15 per session all the way up to $50 or more, again, depending on if you have deductibles. But one of the things that we do is we figure that out before the patient even comes in the door so that there are no surprises. So when you call, you know roughly what your out-of-pocket expenses might be. Um, now, I, we had talked before that I've heard a lot of people talking about amounts of time, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of maximum amount of time that the services will be paid for. Mm -hmm. But you said that turns more on whether the therapy is being effective or not. Is that right? Is yeah, that that's, for the most part, that's true. Most insurances, again, they're, they're going to be outliers, don't have a set number of days that they're going to approve your services for. Some do. I mean, if you sign up for a plan that says you're only going to get 60 consecutive days of rehabilitation, then that's the way it's going to be. That's, that's the plan that you signed up for. Um, most of the insurances have um, a caveat where they'll say, it's either a set number of visits, so not so much a calendar timeline, but like 10 sessions, 20 sessions, 30, or so forth. Um, but within there, what's the most important thing is that you as a patient are making progress towards your goals. So if we have a goal to say, hey, I want to be able to get up and down those stairs a little bit easier than I do now because my knee hurts and my hip hurts, and after a month of therapy, it's just not getting any better. If that's the case, it's not appropriate to, to treat that patient any longer if we can't figure something else out to try. Um, one of the things that you mentioned earlier you had a question on is that do you see the same provider with us? Um, for the most part, you do. Uh, and we try as much as we can to, to keep you on a one-on-one -on -one relationship with your therapist. Um, you know, we have a couple of assistants who work with us that will work one-on-one -on -one with your primary therapist. Um, but I'd say probably 90% of the time you're working with your physical therapist, occupational therapist, every single time you come in. And what that allows us to do is really get that good dialogue going between the patients to say, hey, is this any better than it was last week when I saw you? The therapist knows the patient. They don't necessarily have to spend a lot of time reviewing the chart and say, okay, what did you do last time? What did you do the mm -hmm. time before that? To figure out what they're gonna do on this next, next session as they come in. So that one-on-one -on -one line, one-on-one -on -one dialogue helps us speed up the process and just really get down to the nitty gritty. They put a patients. little, you know, to to, to, to frame it in a uh, specific thing, if we take something that would be, I wouldn't say common, but something you see quite often, either a, let's say a hip 
replacement or a, 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 a knee joint replacement. Can you just kind of lead us through yeah. your a general length of time and the nature of what would occur there? They kind of yeah. bring it up. Uh, so once the patient comes in the door, the therapy should always start with a good evaluation because not everybody who's had a hip replacement or a knee replacement is starting off at the same point. So what we're going to do is do a good evaluation and see, okay, what is your pain level right now? What is your range of motion level right now? How well does the hip move or the knee move and what's your strength like? And then what are, what are the difficulties that you're having on a daily basis now? You know, are you having trouble with your stairs? Are you having trouble walking around the community? Once we figure out that, then we say, well, what are your goals? Are you still working? Do you have to get back to work? Are you volunteering somewhere so that, you know, the, the program can really be designed to meet the needs of the, the patient who's coming in? And then after we have that, every physician is going to have their own protocols and have slight variations on that. So Dr. Howard might have a specific protocol that the therapist is going to follow, and then a physician from another hospital might have a slightly different protocol. So the therapist is going to know that protocol and be aware of that. Not that there's that much variation there. Um, after a knee replacement, I'd say most people are coming in to see us anywhere from a week to, to two weeks after they've had the surgery. Sometimes it's a little bit quicker for some physicians and patients. Sometimes it's a little bit slower. Do they have to go to home care? Um, do they have a hard time getting in? You know, there's a little bit of variation there. And once they, after that, uh, a knee replacement would probably see us for, I'd say on average, maybe a month or two, and a hip replacement's probably a little bit less than that. Um, maybe spread out a little bit more because the healing is just a little bit slower on those It's amazing now, right? They're up and walking right yeah. away. And they of, yeah, they yeah. of. I mean, there, there are some surgeons who they do knee replacements as a day surgery now. They, they, you're not even getting those, um, those overnight admissions anymore because they, there is a lot of research that shows patients get better when they get home faster. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't want to spend that much time at the hospital because it, it slows down your mobility. And, and the more research that we do, we know that the more mobility that you have, the more you get up and walk around, the better off you're gonna be. It prevents a lot of other complications and it just helps you heal faster. So most of the new protocols and guidelines are really about early motion and, and getting up and moving as fast as you can. And the, the general notion of, you know, the, the whole pain, mm -hmm. I, I think people, I mean, just to be honest, I think people will say, what is it gonna be like? And is it, am I going to have to go through a lot of pain mm -hmm. to get to where I want to go? And what's, yeah. what's the kind of... Uh, everybody's different. I mean, it, it's not... Most people have some discomfort. Uh, you know, to call it pain is so subjective based on the individual. You know, you'll have two people who had the same surgery from the same surgeon on the same day. One said they have 9 out of 10 pain. One says they have 1 out of 10 pain. So much of it is subjective based on patients' past experiences with pain and how... And, and, the, how long that pain has been there. So it's hard to say it. I'd say if you've had some sort of a surgery, you're probably going to have some discomfort. But like I mentioned before, the more you get up and move around, generally the better off you're going to be. If right. you're not moving a lot and you're sitting in a hospital bed thinking how much your knee hurts, your knee's probably going to start to hurt a little right. bit more. If you get up and move around and say, well, hey, I had to get up and move around and I did my exercises, most of the research shows us that you're going to feel better and, ha and your pain's going to go away much now, faster. I was reading about to kind of change tack a little bit there. One of the programs that you deal with now is sort of driving mm -hmm. and, you know, either Alzheimer's or, you know, the, the yeah. issues related to driving. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so one of our occupational therapists does a driving assessment program. Um, same idea in terms of referring from a physician comes in, but it's a great program for seniors or maybe their family members or their physicians who they just aren't sure if they should be on the road anymore. And so what we've come up with is we have a very objective way of testing that and getting some good evidence that says you are safe to be on the road or maybe you should think about not driving any longer. Um, it's a two-part process. The first part is the patient will come in to our clinic and we offer that at Baker Ave in Concord, sit down with our occupational therapist and they do a series of testing there. They do reaction time. They do some stuff on the computer. Um, color recognition and, and you know, a lot of different things like that. And if you pass that, then they do an on-road. We have a, a partnership with um, the Central Mass Safety School, I think is what it is, um, where we have a car on our, uh, in our parking lot that our occupational therapist can take you out and actually, in a, um, just like the teenagers do when they're getting their license, they get the brake pedal on that side and everything. Um, so the occupational therapist will take you out there and actually test you on the road and give you, the patient, and your physician and family just some good concrete data that says, 
I think you are okay to drive and here is why, or I don't think you're okay to drive and here is why. You know, you, when I listen to you, I have the impression that the fact that somebody has raised this issue, either the patient or their relatives, leads one to, a, to the, the conclusion that, that the ultimate conclusion might be that, you know, that you, you can't drive anymore right. Right, in the vast majority of cases just because they brought it up. Is mm -hmm. that true? or does, No, no? I, I, I'm not 100 percent certain, but I would say the majority of people who come through our program are actually okay to drive. And it, and it just kind of gives them that confidence that says, oh, the point of this was not to take away my license. It was to say, hey, actually, I'm better than I thought I was. So, yeah, so the, the reason that I raised it is you really want people to know. Yeah. You know, and if they, exactly. if they hear about it, this is approached in the fear, they're going mm -hmm. to take my car away. Right. Uh, but you're, what, what, what you just said is many people are clear, right? Uh, yeah, I, I, again, I'd say probably more than half are, are given the okay and, and they have that, that information that says, hey, I am okay, my reaction time was okay, I was safe on the road, and it's not just up to a physician to say, I don't think you are, yeah. or your family or, or even yourself to say, I don't think you are. Now it says, I know I am, or I have some good evidence that says I'm not. Yeah, I, I would, my assumption is I, I that with the rising percentage of seniors in the population and the rising unfortunate uh, prevalence of, uh, of mental disabilities of some sort or memory mm -hmm. disabilities, this mm -hmm. is an increasing issue. Yeah, the program is getting busier and busier every year. The majority of people that we do assessments on are seniors, but we, we've been doing them on younger people as well. People who've had concussions or head injuries, they want to get that clearance to say, am I okay or not okay? So I think a lot of people could, anybody. maybe you could do it on some of their teenagers. They would probably have a higher percentage. Dangerous. Of them. Not, uh, that's not true. I right. think teenagers are good drivers. <laughs> I mean, I mean, uh, are there any other programs uh, yeah. like we've just discussed that you'd like to highlight? Or, or yeah, I mean, I think the one thing I would like to say is not only do we do rehabilitation after an injury or when somebody feels like they're not doing something as well as they were the stairs or something like that we also within the hospital have a lot of programs designed to keep people healthy um, and as I was mentioning before there's a lot of research on on motion and mobility and getting up and move around there's so much research and evidence now that says the more you exercise the healthier you're gonna be so exercise is such a great way to stay healthy and prevent maybe some of these injuries from happening Maybe you can't really prevent a fall, but maybe it reduces your risk of a fall. So the hospital through our health and wellness center and some of the programs through our rehab department, we offer classes, a lot of them designed for seniors, on strengthening, conditioning, balance, um, yoga, a lot of different exercise classes to try to keep people healthier so that they don't have to go through the hospital and go through the rest of the... So kind of along those dimensions, maybe this puts you on the spot, but if you take a patient's if you take a group of patients or who you consider to be highly successful in rehab mm -hmm. and another that have problems, what, what would be some of the characteristics of the successful people versus the ones that would have problems? When I would say that the people, the more motivated patients who are more willing to get up and move around and kind of follow the instructions that the therapist is giving them and kind of embracing that. And a lot of the, the rehab nowadays is focused around exercise. You know, if people have gone through physical therapy or occupational therapy 30 years ago, it's not gonna look the same as it is now. You know, we used to do a lot of what they call modalities, you know, ultrasound and hot packs and cold packs and massage. Um, and, and that really isn't all that prevalent anymore. It's really all about exercising. And if it's physical therapy, we're gonna get you up and moving around. And if it's occupational therapy, they're gonna be doing a lot of stuff in our clinic at least, um, exercising your hands and your elbows and your arms. So it's really all about moving around and exercising. So the more a patient can embrace that and do their exercises, do their homework, just like they did when they were in school. The, the kids who do their homework are probably the more successful ones in school. It's the same thing in rehab. The more people can embrace those exercises and follow through on them, those are the patients who probably tend to do better. Yeah. I would imagine there's something about being truthful yeah. about the, what you're feeling. You know, sometimes people say things that they just want to get out of there, right? Yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah, it, you can't really just go through the motions and, and, you know, you have to say, okay, this is why I'm doing it and I'm going to do it as much as they say. Not necessarily more than what they say, but I'm going to do it as much as they say. Those are the patients who I think tend to do better. So if there were, uh, I, I, I tend to ask this question, if there are a few things 
just highlights that you want people to think about when they mm -hmm. think about Amundsen rehabilitation? What would those be? You know, I, I would say it's we're up to date on the latest research and evidence. So we try to do what they call evidence-based care, evidence-based practice. So we're, we're, like I mentioned, we're not doing things the same way we did 20 or 30 years ago. So we're always looking to hire, cl hire clinicians who embrace that philosophy, who are the active learners so that we can do better treatments today than we did yesterday. Um, the one-on-one -on -one care, you know, we, we don't use a lot of assistance. We don't use a lot of um, non-licensed professionals to deliver our care. We don't use any non-licensed professionals to deliver our care. So I think the quality of care you're going to get at Emerson is going to be higher than a lot of other local practices and, and not saying anything bad about any of them. Uh, but I know the care that we give there. And like I mentioned before, we have that connection with the rest of the hospital. So I have a direct line to any of the physicians if I need to ha get in touch with them. My clinicians have a direct line to get in touch with them and all the other services that we can offer and really tie it in so we can treat you from your knee replacement all the way through your rehab and then set you up for some exercise classes afterwards to help stay healthy and hopefully not have to come back into the system in, a, in another six months for another injury or something like that. Okay, well, I'd like to thank you. Thank you for for coming today and, and talking about this with us. But on a, on a more important level, thank you and your staff for what you do for an enormous amount of people. It's very, it's very valuable work. It's, very, it's meaningful to those people in terms of their ability to get back into their normal routines. And thank you from their, their, their relatives and friends who, who really appreciate the support you give to people. So thank it's you good very work. Much. Thank appreciate you. that. Thank you. Okay, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Angela, and she's going to tell you about a whole range of things in the, in the Council on Aging. Thank you, Tim. So Debbie and I will go back and forth with some of the programs and some of the things that we're up to. Um, I'd just like to make one comment because we see a lot of the um, seniors who have knee replacements and hip replacement, and the one piece of advice that I will give that one of the patients told me is that if somebody's going to have a knee or hip replacement to talk to their orthopedic doctor about exercises before they have the surgery, Absolutely. not even after. Absolutely. Because if they go in with their muscles and tendons in good shape, they are much li more likely to come out better in the end. So talk to your doctors first and about getting in shape for the surgery. What I've heard is that day, Right, a magic marker, this knee. <laughs> they do that for you. <laughs> they do that for you. <laughs> that for you. Yeah. So I, I was very, um, you know, pleased that one of um, our seniors told me that, and I have passed that information that on is. to people, and I think it has made a big difference um, for people being able to um, be more prepared for what they're getting into. So... We do a bunch of lunches, as you know, since you help with our um, Chelmsford Crossing lunch, and we're doing one in March. And we're going to have the um, traditional corned beef and cabbage meal, but if you don't like that, we'll get you some chicken. We just have to know beforehand. And we're going to have um, another doctor coming and giving a program. Dr. Megan Ford from Hear Smart Audiology is going to present the latest in hearing aid technology and the impacts of untreated hearing loss. And so um, we've had Dr. Ford talk on our television program, but I think it will be good for people to have one-on-one -on -one time with her. And then um, the next day... She That'll be interesting to hear. <laughs> <laughs> she's going to come here to Town Hall and do some free hearing tests. So if you're out there and you're wondering, um, would a hearing aid help you? And for some people it does, and for some people it doesn't. Uh, it depends on what your hearing loss is. You can get a free test right here in town hall. You don't have to go out of town. What do you think the percentage of people who have hearing loss in the elderly population is? What do you think? It's pretty high. Yeah. I've had hearing aids for I would three say it's years. 50% or more, wouldn't you? I, I, yeah, probably, if not more. Take away, try not. Take away the stigma from it, right? I mean, get in there and do it if you need it. Yep. Yeah. If you can't hear, and I think for some people, they sort of segregate themselves and stop going to events because right. it's too hard to hear people, and they're embarrassed to keep saying, could you repeat that? They really need to get tested and find out whether 
a hearing aid could right. help. Right. So then we're going to go to Ferns for our senior moments in March 11th and April 8th. And our men's breakfast, we're getting a um, bigger group. You should come over some Thursday, second Thursday of the month. I might do that. Um, we have, my poor husband got conned into doing this. And so he has gotten an amazing array of things that he's cooking. He makes French toast and scrambled eggs. He always has scrambled eggs. And he went on and studied and practiced on how to make the best <laughs> scrambled eggs. <laughs> And he'll have some sort of meat, and there'll be fresh fruit, and some Danish, and uh, some goodies and for everyone. So we hope people come and join us, and we're lucky enough that often the chief of police comes, and, and people get to talk to him as well. We'll have our coffee, which is hosted um, in March by the school administration. They're going to come and um, put on a big spread, and that is for both men and women. And then in April, we're going to have Carolyn show at Nancy West, and the De Benedictuses will host the coffee. And they are both at the Village Court in, um, off of Church Street. And then we're going to do the Concord Carlisle High School St. Patrick's Day event, right. which is always a great take, and the kids put that on for free. And that will be on March 16th at 12 noon. You can show up after 1130. And they always usually have some great entertainment as well. We offer transportation for that one, I believe, as well. Thank you, Debbie. Yep. So people just need to call you. Call me if they need a ride to, to attend the luncheon. And then in March, we're going to have our COA lunch, which is always the third Thursday of the month. And we're going to have Stephen Collins, who's a really phenomenal actor come and he is going to do Sailing Towards My Father which is a one man play um, written by Carl Rossi about Herman Melville and he is just incredible and we were lucky enough to get a grant for the Cultural Council Rem to where pay is that? for him. Where? That would be right at FRS. At FRS, okay. Yep. And, and I, we'd love to have you join so it's us. it's a lunch and, a, and a, a lunch and the lunch is pizza, salad and dessert. And it's 11.45, so just need to call and let and what, us know. How long would they minutes. plan for the play, do you know? It's an hour. An hour. Yep. And um, with that, I'm going to have Debbie tell you more about transportation. <laughs> Hello, Tim and everyone else. Thank you for letting me be here today. Uh, we are always looking for new alternative transportation options, and I'm happy to announce that the Carlisle's program with Lyft has now officially been launched. Um, this is new, and it's been in the um, discussion for a while, but it is also funded through the Chenard Grant that Angela mentioned earlier. Um, this basically is going to, the Lyft program is basically for community um, people who are seniors or disabled, 18 and older, um, as an alternative transportation option. Um, if you have a smartphone and you'd like to be a part of this, basically what you need to do is download the Lyft app, and then you're going to send to the COA, come and register with us, providing your email address and a phone number associated with a Lyft account. Now, you can be an existent client, excuse me, existent resident in the community still using LAP, excuse me, using Lyft currently. And what we're going to do is we're going to try to offer a discount program so that you can have four rides during the month that would be discounted. Um, we would, with the Lyft program, we would pay the first $2 and, no, excuse client. me, I apologize, thank you. The client would pay the first $2. Then we would cover the, up to the next $10 and then basically above that the client would pay the difference so for example let's say you are a resident in the community you've downloaded the app to your smartphone and you have contacted lyft and you want to go to trails Inn in concord okay basically the amount of money that would cost to go to concord for one way ride is only really nine dollars but you're only paying two dollars because we cover up to the next ten so this is an alternative option for people. You say that was the first four? Or? Uh, no, it's, it's the first $2 that 
I mean, but, but on any ride that they... There's four, if the discount program is four rides per month. Okay. So uh, basically when you contact Lyft, you would have, we're trying to create a group of people that we can actually put on the Lyft program as um, for the discount. So if you're interested in the Lyft program, you contact the COA. We would register you. You would sign up your, download the Lyft, if, excuse me, download the if lap, the Lyft app, <laughs> then register with the COA, and then what we would do is contact Lyft, and they assign an account number to your phone or associated phone number for the Lyft app. Generally, most people have to have a smartphone, okay, in order to do it themselves. And Lyft will give us an associated account number, and then each month there would be four rides that would be discounted. At the end of the 30 days, it rolls over to the next month. And a so, ride is one way. And a ride is one way, thank you. I'm not trying to create work for you, but if, if somebody wanted, because sometimes this initiation process is a little complex for people, if they were to come over here with their smartphone, you could help them do that, and get it going and all that? Well, we could. Uh, yeah. we're, to be honest with you, this is all baby steps right now because it's a brand new program for us. So we're starting to walk the road and, and get this going. Yeah, I'm just, this, this initial technology thing is sometimes a barrier for some people. Well, you know, there are a lot, of, a lot of seniors who have smartphones and are familiar with how to work them. Then you have those that are not. Yeah. So well, if you were a senior... Those two things don't go together, having correct. it familiar. <laughs> correct. <laughs> That's correct. That is correct. Because with the app, they basically... I don't know if everybody's familiar with, with Lyft, and I can honestly say I don't use it. So I am familiar with it, but I've never used it, have family who have used it. So you have the uh, app on your smartphone, your smartphone. You ask for a ride. They're going to contact you on your smartphone and say... Um, Maria will be there in a blue Ford in five minutes to pick you up and take you. Um, so if a senior or a disabled person is able to do that, it's an alternative ride for them that I may not be able to do with our van or our COA um, SUV due to the time frame or the conflicts I might be experiencing with time. Uh, Lyft and Uber have there's a little bit of variability in the Carlisle area because of the population density in terms of the amount of time that, that it takes, but you'll gain experience with that because that's, that's what people right. have to, you know. And as I said, a number of people, we found out, I believe there's something like 2,500 people in the community who are already using Lyft on their sure. own. Sure. So it's, it's already known in the community. This is kind of going to try and help the people who are older right. or some disabled people, but we're still kind of working out the kinks so to speak yeah. but it's officially up and running so have people contact us we can try and walk you through the process we're very lucky we have one volunteer that helps people with smartphones okay oh, they want to know how to use them and also if they want to know how to buy one or get the best so there's plan. a way to get that information if right right yeah. and so i'm sure he could help and we also have at least three people who help with computers so if somebody's having a problem with a computer, they can give us a call and we'll have somebody, um, mm -hmm. you know, help them out with that. We just had one of them give a talk yesterday at the library about how not to get scammed on your computer. So we'll be getting that information out in our weekly or bi-monthly email. So one last thing on that. What I understand with this program is if the person doesn't have a smartphone and they have a flip phone and they it's very difficult for them to download an app. So they have to be able to be contacted somehow via text um, so that the confusion, I just don't want people to be confused with that. So they have to be able to contact them via a phone call or a text to be able to contact from the person coming to pick them up. So yeah, I'm still learning the road too here, so I sound a little confused, but I'm working it out. <laughs> it's generational. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so um, in, because we don't have a senior center currently, and um, we try to have as many 
luncheons for our seniors as possible. So we go out of town and we're taking people to Neshoba Tech once a month and um, enjoying their wonderful um, meals. And on March 20th, people can go. And last week, I think we had 27 of our seniors, you know, go have a lovely lunch and enjoy themselves. We're also starting a new program uh, where we're going to UTEC in Lowell. We're, and UTEC is a program for young adults age 17 to 25 who decided to trade violence and poverty for social and economic success. So this is uh, something new. We've done it once before and it worked out very nicely. So we're trying to give people options to have a nice lunch, be with seniors and enjoy themselves even if we don't have the facilities to um, provide uh, uh, lunch. Say how that works again. I wasn't clear on how, with this other organization. The <clears> other <throat> one, UTEC? Yeah. So it's a program where you would sign up like you would sign up for anything. There will be a van that will take the first 13 people that go, or you can go yourself, and um, you will pay a flat fee, which we've um, subsidized and have lunch and then come back or you know is it, go is it at here. this organization or is it at a restaurant or how? it's at their organization okay. in Lowell okay. okay and they they provide the food and it's right. like Mike Mishoba does they right cook, they okay. cook the they, food don't they, they cook yeah the they food? it's a culinary arts program like Nishoba. okay so people would um you know pay for the meal and then chat with the people they yeah. came with and enjoy themselves and then come home yeah, great and um, we also are having our annual student council tea where the middle school hosts the seniors at the school and provide refreshments and games and conversation. And that's always well received and they do a fantastic job. And it's March 28th at 1 p.m. And I think what's most encouraging about that is you get to not only um, meet the kids but see how bright their future is. Right. It makes you feel wonderful to see the talent and the skills of the kids in the school. Yeah, I was I I continually reminded of that, and I was I was a little dismayed by the by the recent article related to the to the ferns thing with the kids, and uh, you know, and I, I think these that's not the kids I know in Carlisle, so it's there's something that we don't know, right? That they don't have a place to go, or it's not proper, you know, and more interactions like this, I think, between seniors and the kids will help that out no question i agree debbie you want to talk more about our okay. regular transportation yep we have some great trips coming up uh just a reminder too about our weekly friday market basket trips we still go every friday and it's a free trip to go to the grocery store um but because we are experienced and in more people coming and bringing their bags and groceries. We're asking to m maximize the amount of people to about eight or nine on the Friday trip. Um, so if you really want to go, try to give me a call by noon on Thursdays. Which to let store me do you go to? I'm sorry? Which store do you go to? We go to the uh, one in Westford. The Westford corner market, basket. market basket, correct. You the big one. Yes. Oh, I go to the big one. <laughs> yeah. Yep, yeah. no, uh, we drop them off in the in the morning around 9.30, and uh, they shop and generally go to the cafe and have a little coffee, and then uh, brings a van around and loads them up, brings them back, and they all have a great time. Yeah. So, so just a reminder on that. Um, we have some trips and restaurant reviews coming up. Uh, we're going to the Red Heat Restaurant over in Bedford on Tuesday, March 12th for 11.30. Uh, so if you want to go, please give us a call. We're going to have all of these at the lunches sign-up sheets so everyone can sign up if they'd like to go. Um, that's a new restaurant for us. I hear it's pretty good, so we're going to find out. We're also going back to a favorite on Tuesday, April 9th, uh, to the Bamboo. And on Wednesday, May 8th, we're going to Nancy's Airfield Cafe, which is always a favorite. Now, one we haven't been to in a very long time and we're going to the Museum of Russian Icons, and that's going to be on Tuesday, March 26th. And that's supposed to be a really great one. I haven't been there, but I understand they've gone in the past and they enjoyed that. Um, our good old friend, Mr. Benedictus, is going to take some people again back to the um, Greater Boston Stage Company to see Million Dollar Quartet 
on Wednesday, May 15th. So those are some of the trips that are forthcoming. We hope everyone will sign up and be a part of it. We'd like to have fun with them. Okay. And then we go back to um, trying to do some lectures, and we have a number of health lectures coming. Uh, we have a discussion on oral cancer and a free oral cancer screening on March 12th at the library at 1.30. We're doing a program on integrated therapies, a holistic approach to pain and symptom management, also at 1.30 on April 2nd at the Gleason Library. And all this will be in the newsletter that's getting mailed next week. And people can call us to schedule themselves. And another um, alternative is alternative medicine is we're having a program on May 28th on alternative medicines, dietary supplements. Are they really safe? And that's on the 28th of May at 1.30 at the library. But in case um, that is in your <clears throat> cup of tea, then we try to do some other things. We have two knitting programs. One is for people who just want to knit on their own, and one is through FRS that we knit for the homeless in Boston. And this year we knitted over 200 hats and scarves that were donated at Christmas time, so we're knitting away for next Christmas. It's we amazing. When they take that down there and they give them out, it's amazing the gratitude that the people have for that, for, the, for those efforts, yeah. So we hope people join us, and if they don't want to come to the knitting groups once a month, they can um, just knit on their own and bring them in. And we have a meditation group every Monday at 1 o'clock at Benfield Farm. We have a book group that's meeting the next time on Monday, March 4th. We have a social hour once a month at Benfield Farm where people can come, have some refreshments, chat, meet neighbors, and um, learn about what's happening in town. We have a new um, thing that we've started probably in the last year where we have one of the practitioners from Emerson again who does Reiki for our own seniors, and that's at Benfield Farms. And so you just need to call and schedule for a Reiki appointment. And it's on March 25th is the next one. And Debbie, can you tell us something about our exercise sure, program? Sure, well, to enhance what yeah. you do, and we try very hard to keep our seniors active. We offer a number of uh, exercise classes. Mondays, we offer tap. Tuesdays, we offer Zumba and Tai Chi. Wednesdays, we offer yoga, and that is actually through the recreation department, so they have to really contact the recreation department. We do advertise for them, but I understand there's a great following there. We do line dancing as well. And on Thursdays, we have fitness and cardio, two separate classes. And on Fridays, we do Sama, and Sama is one of our people here, she enjoys it very much, as the senior approach to maintaining agility. But all of these are fun classes. They're low impact just to keep you physically fit, muscle toning, to keep everyone going. And they all have people who love it and they keep coming back. But we're always looking for more seniors to be active, to stay busy and be a part of it. And we'd love them to join us. That's great. I do, you do you want to hit on some of the other exercises Well, we do, we, have? we do have a podiatry clinic at Benfield Farms, and that's going to be March 4th and March 5th. That is by appointment, so you need to call the COA. Uh, we have haircuts on the go, and that's going to be Monday, March 18th, and April 29th, and they should give us a call. But we have two great ladies who come, and for only $10.50, you can get your hair trimmed beautifully done. Uh, we have an outside walking group that on Thursdays at 9.30 over here, I believe, in the, uh, oh, it's the, Bedford, the park. And uh, then we also have the walking at the school. And that's usually Mondays through Fridays, 6.45 to 7.30 a.m. So we have a lot going on. Just give us a call, and we'd love to hook you up if you're really interested in being find part something. of it. In that array of things, you should be able to find something to stay at. I would right? think so. Uh, yep. Yeah. And if somebody feels that they just can't afford the classes, they're pretty reasonable. Most of them are three months for $40. All they do need to do is talk to us. And they're subsidized now, but they can be subsidized further through the Friends. Yes. So we don't want anybody not to come because of um, their finances. So um, 
we just have a couple of other programs we'd like to highlight. One is a lecture by um, a gentleman who actually was an expedition technical director for the search for Medusa, which is a um, shipwreck that happened in 1816. Yeah. And he's going to be at the library on May 1st at 7 p.m. and talk about that expedition. And everybody goes and dives and no. sees the ship. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to ask them to do that. Um, if you ever take the MBTA or take the commuter rail, we're going to, in actually this room, have a senior Charlie card event where if you don't have a senior Charlie card now, you can come in, we'll take your picture, we'll give you the form, and the MBTA will mail you the card at home. So it's a free event, and we need at least 15 people, so the more the merrier. If you haven't done this, if you're listening, do it. It's, it's great. It, it works really easily, and it works on all the public transportation. Including the boat? Right, and it's, it's a significant discount. So I, there's no reason not to do this if you live in Boston. If you're 65 <laughs> or <laughs> older, Boston and area. you do not have to live in Carlisle. Right. Um, we should really say that. Most of our programs, you don't have to live in Carlisle. Right. So if you're listening to us and you live in Concord or a surrounding town, feel free to give us a call because it's only rarely will we limit. Okay, I think we're, we're getting near the wrap up, right? Uh, so I, uh, what, let's talk a little bit about the next program. What do we have on tap? Uh, the next program, we have a judge coming to talk to us about the justice program and um, that is followed by a, in, that's in March, on March 20th. On April 17th, we have the, someone coming from the Emory, Emerson Auxiliary to talk about what they do. So that'll be really interesting, and I understand Frank Rigg is going to do the... Yes, Frank's going to be our host. It will be his first time hosting. So for those of who, who don't know, Frank is a, was the director of the Kennedy Library for a, a many, many years. So this should be a, a, a fascinating discussion So at the next. At Before the next. we close, I just want to bring up there's one more program that I just want to let people know about that's coming if you want to learn how to garden. garden we have a Master Gardeners program that's going to be put on and starting on April 25th. Master Gardener. Well, wow, that's great. All right. Well, I think with all of that that's going on, which is enormous, uh, I would, as I always do, thank Angela and the entire staff for all of the work that uh, the COA does on behalf of the seniors. Uh, it's an extraordinary array of programs and activities that are provided for them, and we, uh, in terms of everybody in the community, not just the seniors, I think there's great appreciation for that. So with that, I'll bring the February uh, Concord Community Forum to a close and hopefully we'll see you all again next month when we uh, do the show again. Thank you.